Thank you, God, for bringing us together to hear your word and to rejoice in the marvelous love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lost and found. There's nothing worse than being lost. Do you remember being a child, somehow losing the sight of your parent? Perhaps you were in a department store, maybe a supermarket, maybe out in the neighborhood, and all of a sudden you realize you didn't see your mommy or your daddy and you were lost. And there's only one worse feeling for, than the child experiencing that is for the parent to experience that. Have you ever experienced that feeling where what was right with you all of a sudden is gone and that this uh, tremendous feeling of despair, thankfully many, many times, of course, with joyful uh, resolution. I think that that's the feeling that God has for us is that when we are lost and disoriented to life, is that there is such a concern and yet the joyful celebration, bringing back into a wonderful relationship this beautiful phrase, rejoice with me, that there is emphasis on the one, that the one who repents, the one who is brought back in, creates even greater joy than the 99 who are righteous. And that is amazing God language because that is nothing like me at least. And as I explore this language, is that is God's promise to you and I that God's ways are not our ways, that there is a sensitivity. And I'm trying to lay this out, that God's love is so uniquely personalized to each and every one of us. And in that person, personhood is an emphasis upon building the community. It is God's love is both, both deeply personal and shapes and builds community. There is no other love than Jesus' love like this. The first lesson speaks of Moses as a mediator. Perhaps you remember the story that he's up with God's presence, 10 commandments being created, and as he's gone, the people become disoriented and start lifting up their own self-made gods and giving attributes to these uh, obviously a man-made, uh, gods that are created, including this golden calf, reflecting the uh, fertility gods of the area in which they were. And such a strange time. Perhaps you remember the Ten Commandments, the movie, and that, uh, that's, that sequence as the people are rebellious. And what is it that allows Moses to come back into this relationship? People are lost and disoriented as a group. There's no one filling the gap, leading people back into God's promises, and it is Moses who is amazingly confident in God's promises, who basically says, God, you promised. You promised. And from this reminder of God's promises is this fantastic phrase, chapter 32, verse 14, and the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he was planning to bring on his people. This idea of changing, of repenting, of coming into right relationship. This part of the Old Testament reading is a God that is so close. Sometimes the scriptures emphasize a God who is so divine and above all, but this is the closeness of God. This is the closeness that's described in Genesis when it speaks of hearing the God walking in, in the garden. This is the one in which there is a relationship. And I guarantee you, you can always claim the promises of God for love through Jesus Christ. You can claim these promises to be of true and to help with the disorientation that comes through life. The second uh, lesson, the second reading from 1 Timothy is Paul speaking about his own personal disorientation. He speaks of himself as a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence and leads into this amazing discussion that he received mercy and by the grace of God. And verse 15, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am the most foremost. The reason he says I am the most foremost because he knows himself. And I think each one of us, as we know, we have lost the way at least portions of our life my message to any of you who are struggling about your past and decisions that have been made, efforts that were undertaken, things that were left undone, that created damage in your life and the life of others, is that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners, you and me. And the self-labeling that we are beneath, 
we are lost, that we are unable to receive the grace of God is a falsehood and is set aside by the promises that God has made. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the lyrics we sang earlier, be honor and glory forever and ever. And I say that to you with great confidence, not because of my own personal confidence, but my confidence in God's promises, that for each and every one of us, God's future far exceeds our past, and there is this full acceptance that comes through trusting and having Jesus Christ as our Savior. What a gift. And then the gospel message itself. I think you remember that tax collectors were hated because they knew the community. They would be people, Jewish people, that knew where people were at. They knew what assets they had. They, they worked underground for the Roman government in the sense of they knew where stuff was at. And so they would out their friends for taxes. And sinners is a broad category, but it was all the undesirables that were coming to listen to Jesus and the people who were more ritually pure and with uh, an intent to bring people to God, the Pharisees were, and the scribes, people of the church, were basically saying, look at all these losers. Now, I look out at you and I see only winners. Except for myself once in a while, and perhaps, perhaps for yourself once in a while. I, uh, I always get uh, interested in this. Over the years that I've been a pastor, I've had people say this, I'm not good enough for church. And my response back to them is, if that's the case, either am I. If this is an exclusionary club for people who got it together, then we miss the whole purpose of why Jesus came, to came to save sinners. We come here because we hear God's promises and are filled with love and gratitude of God's love for us through Jesus Christ. And this joy of bringing others into our community, people who have lost their way, is one of the great joys of life. It, there is a sense of humor to the gospel message, or let me say it this way, if you had a hundred sheep and you're in the wilderness and you lose one, are you gonna leave 99 and go after the one? Wouldn't you say, good riddance? Don't even want it in the gene pool anymore. Thank you, God, for taking that one away. And pastors, we meet on Tuesdays, and we were talking about this. Now, this can be a good challenge for pastors because our job is, of course, to be shepherds of our congregation. And if you didn't know this, you're hard to keep up with because you're on the move, you're going different places, different things happen in life, there's anything but stability. And so sometimes we're not sure where people are going, where they've been, from the practical to are you in the hospital, perhaps in rehab, or are you on vacations? And, and so we do struggle. And you know, if I said to you, of the 1,368 members we have right now, but with another 20 coming in, but with the general flow, right, right around 1,400 or so, each of you gets an hour of my time per year. Is that good enough for you? Okay, and if I don't see you, just know that I'm hanging with people that are really in serious need. I was thinking about this to say to the church council, you know what, we've got a great group of people here. I'm gonna go hang in the bars and really go after the people that need help. And uh, that would be a good way for me to move into retirement. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's not quite how we understand this, but. It is this idea that is it really, is there really joy after the one who repents? That, that's God's love, that's not our love, right? Because all of us have written off people because of their, the, the challenge. And perhaps you've experienced the heartache of being the one written off. Perhaps you've been that black sheep in the family. Perhaps you've experienced this and it is God's promise to love and to bring a tremendous joy in the repentance when we turn as simply as Paul said, yes, it is true, I have gone wrong, but I have received mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am front row for this amazing movement of grace in my life. The other issue that comes up with the second uh, parable here about 10 silver coins is, isn't it amazing? We were talking about this and sometimes you go, well, one sheep, who cares about one sheep, but 10% of my money? Oh, I will go after that. And 
that is a part of our sin, is that we may treat money or possessions, even more importantly, we treat people. People are God's prized possessions, number one. And so this is a, a little bit of a test that are the silver coins worth it. And let's be honest, if you lost a coin, would you bring other people in and tell them that you lost the coin? You would do anything to let that get out that you had lost. And so I, I really think it's just a to the living, to the, the precious living entities that God has created is the number one priority, each and every one of us. You can trust Jesus. Rule number one. The covenant that God has created in your baptism is secure for all time. This beautiful phrase that comes from John chapter 10, verse 27 to 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand as a promise for you and for me and for us to share with this world. Two. There is a great transformation that happens when you move into an area where you seek others for the pursuit of God's grace. And what I mean by that is each one of us has a unique search and rescue profile. Now perhaps you know of search and rescue, wilderness, mountains, water, variety of different places that we can get in trouble. And people are trained about how to find Lots of different tactics, lots of different techniques to be able to search and to rescue. And I, I look at our congregation, when you take us as a whole, the beauty of God's love is that for people who are disoriented to life, what a marvelous resource we can be. For people who have experienced grief and loss, we, the members, have experienced that. And we can reach out to someone who is struggling. For people who are challenged in their health, we, the congregation, we have many experts in search and rescue for people who are struggling with their health. For economic issues of poverty or a sudden loss that creates tremendous strain, we are people who have a helping fund that helps people, but we have the comfort and resource to help people along the way. For those experiencing challenges of mental health, we have felt lost, but we are the people who have been found by the love of God and are able to search and seek out those who are struggling and disoriented. Estrangement in relationships, divorce, and other things, the pain that we have experienced allows us to help orientate those who need to hear about the Jesus, the one who loves, and that we can trust his promises. And things such as drug and alcohol and other uh, things that have taken us off track, our congregation is a resource. And so whatever it is in your life that has created a moment of disorientation, of feeling lost, is actually God's precious investment for you to seek out those who are lost. This is an opportunity for us. Let me go back to the final point. This beautiful phrase from uh, John 10, to hear the voice of Jesus, is the incredible opportunity of our congregation. When I hear Kate speak of a little girl's dreams dashed because of the lack of water to celebrate with her classmates. We can help the orientation for that young woman to know that she is not alone. We can partner with this ministry and not just for water, but for a long time coming to repartner and to reach beyond ourselves to people who need to hear the good news, the good news that God's promises are true and we will love and serve one another. Anybody feeling lost today, I ask you to recall God's promises. For anybody here who knows somebody who's lost, I invite you to go after with vigor that one person who needs to hear about God's love and to turn them on to the love of Christ. And what an opportunity for us to be a congregation where those who are lost are found in the celebration that we are a part of, this celebration. This is God's character. It's not ours, this is God's character the absolute rejoicing for those who repent and turn to the love of God. What an amazing God we have. Trust his promises and be assured. In Jesus' name, amen.